So I just want to say that this is, uh, for me, one of the most anticipated events of our season and definitely a highlight of Women's History Month, not to mention a year when a woman is, I will qualify this, at least this week, the front-running candidate for the presidency. Uh, if you've looked at the back of the book, you'll see that um, uh, writer Anne Lamott calls Rebecca Traster the most brilliant voice on feminism in this country. I would say that that is a slight understatement. Um, <laughs> Rebecca's, Rebecca's work is not just brilliant. It's original, it's fresh, it's unafraid, it's provocative, and it's really, really, really important, especially now, especially in 2016, with so much at stake and with women as such a potentially uh, potent political force in our country. Um, tonight, Rebecca will be talking about her new book. It's called All the Single Ladies, Unmarried Women and the Rise of an Independent Nation. For those of you who haven't followed every detail of her career, uh, she moved to New York after college. She got an entry-level job in journalism as a fact checker. And I didn't even know this, or if I knew this, I had forgotten it. She actually had a stint as a gossip columnist. Is that right? That's, that's, that's amazing. Um, she went on to write about film and other aspects of life in New York. And then in 2003, she was hired at Salon.com. And it was there that her career writing about the histories, experience, and lives of women <clears throat> really began in earnest. Um, I first met Rebecca in 2008. I was working on Hillary's campaign. I had been Hillary's speechwriter for many, many years, um, and at that point was a, an advisor to her. And I have to say I had, although I am married to a former journalist who's now switched careers, obviously, uh, but was a long time journalist, I have to say that I had a fairly low opinion of the press. Um, and it was in the cacophony of uh, that Democratic presidential prim primary um, I really felt there were precious few journalists who took the time to think, to really think about what was actually happening in this contest between two historic candidates, one an African-American man, the other a white woman. And one afternoon, I happened to go to a panel discussion, and Rebecca was one of the speakers. I had never met her. I didn't really know that much about her. She was working at salon.com uh, at th that point. And she talked about her observations of the campaign. And it took approximately one nanosecond for me to realize that her insights and her analyses were just so much deeper, so much more thoughtful, and so much more useful than those of other reporters, at least to my own understanding of the seismic undercurrents that were taking place in that uh, presidential race. Um, if, if you haven't read her first book that came out of that campaign called Big Girls Don't Cry, of the zillions of words written about that race, it, this book is by far the best on so many different levels, and I highly recommend it as well. Um, anyway, I feel so lucky that in the intervening years, I've gotten to know uh, Rebecca much better, and I've learned that on top of her being an exceptionally talented writer and social critic, she's also just a wonderful, fun, open, and warm human being. Uh, like many of you here tonight, I have been eagerly awaiting her new book, now it's here. Um, and by the way, it does not disappoint. Yet again, she manages to weave together, together history, economics, law, politics, popular culture, and yes, her own life very, very candidly to br produce another truly remarkable book. Please join me in welcoming Rebecca Traster. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out. I'm going to try to raise the microphone to the appropriate level. Is that right? Is that, can people hear me? All right. Thank you all for coming out. I actually didn't even know it was supposed to snow. Thank you even more for coming out if it's supposed to snow. Um, I am so thrilled to be here. This is one of my favorite places in the universe. Lisa is one of my favorite people. Um, you guys are like the the second reading, and so you're you're still in the guinea pig uh, phase where I'm still testing like what passages work and what passages don't. So I'm going to read a, a little bit from the book, um, and I hope that I neither bore you to tears nor I'm done in two seconds. I hope it's the right balance. Um, I want to I wanted to to talk a little bit about how the shape and scope of this book shifted. It took me five years to write it, um, which is a really long time, <laughs> um, especially if you're somebody like me for whom book writing is kind of a hellish experience. Um, and when I originally sold it in 2010, just before my first book came out, um, it was going to be... It, 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 
it was going to be mostly a book of contemporary journalism that looked at the rapidly expanding ranks of unmarried women in this country and considered the kind of revolutionary impact that this new um, huge population of women living outside of marriage was going to have on our social policies, on our politics, on our culture, on our definitions of what family means. Um, <clears throat> and when I sold it, I sold it as, you know, it's an unprecedented you know, event in American history. And uh, I sort of had, like, maybe in my proposal, a couple sentences about the history of unmarried women in America, which I thought definitely had to do with the Salem witch trials. Um, and I was totally going to write about that. Um, and I sold the book, and it was I was going to write it in a year. And then I started doing... Um, research about the history of single women in the United States. And among the things that I learned is that most of the witches tried in Salem were actually married or widowed, so they don't have anything to do with unmarried women. Uh, that was wrong in my proposal. <laughs> but also that, um, in fact, while this expansion of the population of unmarried women and late married women and the, ri the significantly um, startling rise in marriage ages um, for women and for men, um, is unprecedented in terms of its in terms of its size and its scope. Um, it's what is not un unprecedented um, are fluctuations in the marriage rate, and that there is this tremendous history of single women in the United States, and not just a history of single women living in eras when it was far more difficult to do so, but those single women reshaping the nation, actually creating some of the conditions that now make it possible for more single women to thrive. Um, and so the book took five years. And uh, and it includes, it winds up being quite a mashup um, of, there is some, this is not a story about me, but but my perspective and my experience, I, I was single for 14 years. I married in my mid-30s. Um, uh, my perspective, both as single person and now as a married person, um, is threaded throughout the book. I did do interviews, and my very capable um, research assistant who's sitting here, who is brilliant and wonderful, also did many interviews. Together, we interviewed over 100 people, 100 women across the country, different ages, um, races, classes, ethnicities, um, living in different states, rural and urban. Um, and their stories are in here. And then so is quite a bit of this history that I came came upon and my attempt to make sense of the history of single women in the United States and how they've shaped the country. So the three short, I hope, passages that I'm going to read tonight are try to give a taste of those different approaches to the book because all those different styles are in here. So I'm starting at the very, very beginning, and this is a little bit about my perspective. I always hated it when my heroines got married. As a child... I remember staring at the cover of the first four years, willing myself to feel pleased, as I knew I was meant to, that Laura Ingalls had wed Almanzo Manly Wilder and given birth to baby Rose. I understood that despite the hailstorms, diphtheria outbreaks, and other agrarian misery that Wilder chronicled in the last of her Little House books, Laura's marriage and motherhood were supposed to be read as, happy ending, as a happy ending. Yet to me it felt unhappy, as if Laura were over and in many ways, she was. The images on the covers of previous Little House books, drawn by Garth Williams and the editions I owned, had been of Laura in motion. Front and center, gambling down a hillside, riding a horse barefoot, having a snowball fight. But here she was, stationary and solidly shod, beside her husband. The baby she held in her arms was the most lively figure in the scene. Laura's story was coming to a close. The tale that was worth telling about her was finished once she married. It was the same with Anne of Green Gables' Anne Shirley, whose days of getting her best friend Diana Barry drunk and competing at school with rival Gilbert Blythe were over when at last, after three volumes of resistance and rejected proposals, she gave in and married Gilbert. Beloved Joe March, who in Little Women subverted the marriage plot by not marrying her best friend and neighbor Laurie, came to her clunky canubial end by getting hitched to avuncular Professor Bear. And Jane Eyre, smart, resourceful, sad Jane Eyre. Her prize, readers? <laughs> for real, right? <laughs> After a youth of fighting for some smidgen of autonomy, marrying him. <laughs> the bad-tempered guy who kept his first wife in the attic, 
wooed Jane through a series of elaborate head games and was, by the time she landed him, blind and missing a hand. <laughs> it was supposed to be romantic, but it felt bleak. Paths that were once wide and dotted, dotted with naughty friends and conspiratorial sisters and malevolent cousins, with scrapes and adventures and hopes and passions, had narrowed and now seemed to lead only to the tending of dull husbands and the rearing of insipid children to whom the stories soon would be turned over in pallid follow-ups like Joe's Boys and Anne of Ingleside. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> kind of suck. <laughs> My dismay, of course, was partially symptomatic of the form. Coming-of-age tales, Buildings Roman, come to their tautological ends when their subjects reach adulthood. But embedded in the structure of both literature and life was the reality that for women... Adulthood, and with it, the end of the story, was marriage. Marriage, it seemed to me, walled my favorite fictional women off from the worlds in which they had once run free, or if not free, then at least forward, with currents of narrative possibility at their backs. It was often at just the moment that their educations were complete and their childhood ambitions coming into focus that these troublesome, funny girls were suddenly contained, subsumed, and reduced by domesticity. Later, I would learn that Shakespeare's comedies ended with wedlock and his tragedies with death, making marriage death's narrative equivalent and supporting my childhood hunch about its ability to shut down a story. <laughs> my mother, a Shakespeare professor, would note wistfully to me that some of the bard's feistiest and most loquacious heroines, including Beatrice and Much Ado About Nothing, ceased to have any lines after their dramatically conclusive marriage alliances. Weren't there any interesting fictional women out there who didn't get married as soon as they became grown-ups, I wondered, even as a kid? <clears throat> uh, the next passage I'm going to read, so I, I come across all this history, right? And part of what I learned, probably the most dramatic period that I learned about is the 19th century, when so many American men moved west and were killed in the Civil War, and it upset the gender ratio, and there were a lot of women, um, a lot of middle-class white women on the East Coast specifically, um, who did not get married the end of the 19th century. And a lot of those women um, whose lives were not um, spent fulfilling their wifely and maternal responsibilities devoted their energies, I mean, and this was also sort of feminized impulse, to service, to service to community. And a lot of that, and to God. And um, uh, those paths led them to some of the reform movements, including abolition, suffrage, uh, temperance, um, it led many of them to push into the expansion of secondary education for women, into nursing and teaching fields. Um, the labor movement at the turn of the, the 19th to the 20th century, the settlement house movement. Um, and this was just this incredible history. And all the while, there was an incredible discourse happening in the press about marriage and and the the impositions it placed on women and the way in which in, marriage as it was historically uh, configured was an impediment to equality and I just was so staggered by this history and in the midst of reading it and 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 relying on a lot of really terrific academic books um, I came across a reference to a speech that was given by Susan B. Anthony <clears throat> uh, in 1877 um, and this is I'm, I'm writing and describing it. What I learned as I began my research is that while this moment is unprecedented in terms of its size, thanks to women's contemporary ability to live more economically and sexually autonomous lives than ever before, it is certainly not without historical precedent. Today's unmarried and late married women are walking a road toward independence that was paved by generations of American women who lived singly when it was far harder to do so than it is today. Crucially, many of those radically single and late married women were the ones who were able to devote their unmarried, non-maternal lives to changing the nation's power structures in ways that might better support today's army of free women. In 1877, the never-married suffragist, abolitionist, and labor activist Susan B. Anthony gave a speech called The Homes of Single Women. In it, she prophesied that the journey toward gender equality would necessarily include a period in which women stopped marrying. In woman's transit, this is her, her quote, in woman's transition from the position of subject to sovereign, there must needs be an era of self-sustained, self-supported homes, said Anthony. She continued clairvoyantly, as young women become educated in the industries of the world, thereby learning the sweetness of independent bread, 
it will be more and more impossible for them to accept the marriage limitation that husband and wife are one and that one the husband. Even when man's intellectual convictions shall be sincerely and fully on the side of freedom and equality to women, the force of long existing customs and laws will impel him to exert authority over her, which will be distasteful to the self sustained, self respectful woman. And so, Anthony predicted, logic would lead us, quote, inevitably, to an epoch of single women. Here we are, smack in the middle of Anthony's imagined epoch, an era in which, like the one in which Anthony herself lived, the independence of women is a crucial tool in their long struggle toward a more just and equitable position in the world. The final passage I'm going to read um, is an example of the, some of the kinds of stories I tell about women around the country. And I picked this today in part because um, one of the excerpts of the book that ran in the New York Times this weekend was about the role of female friendship. And that seems to be a part of the book that a lot of people have responded to so far. And it's certainly at the heart of the book and of, you know, my own lived experience. Um, and actually the the women who frame that chapter are probably women who are known to a lot of people in this room they met here in the city in fact i'm willing to bet that there are probably a couple of people who are at the party that i describe in this chapter in this room um and those of you who who don't know them may know the podcast that they do together which is called call your girlfriend um and uh so i thought i would read a little bit about their origin story as friends in 2009 Two women living in Washington, D.C. were invited to a Gossip Girl viewing party. Anne Friedman, then 27, arrived with a boyfriend. Aminatu So, then 24, was wearing a homemade Chuck and Blair shirt in reference to two of the show's nubile protagonists. They noticed each other right away. Amina said she knew immediately that Anne, funny, tall, loquacious, was someone she wanted in her life. Even as they left the party that first night, she hoped that Anne and her then beau would be walking in her direction. They weren't. I remember being really heartbroken, Amina said. But when she got home, she discovered that Anne had already friended her on Facebook and knew that they were meant to be. In a bit of social kismet, both women were invited to another event the very next day. They started hanging out all the time, discovered they shared pop culture and fashion interests. Anne was a journalist, Amina a digital strategist. As a way to get to know each other, they started a pop culture blog called Instaboner that chronicled their literary, political, and stylistic obsessions. We learned to speak the same language, said Amina. We were instantly close, agreed Anne in a separate interview. Though their connection wasn't sexual, the process of falling for each other was almost romantic. With Amina, Anne said, she found, quote, the thing I always wanted but didn't get from relationships with men, pushing me to be better without seeming like they were constantly disappointed in me. She very quickly began to rely on Amina for emotional support, personal advice, and professional counsel. All these things people say they turn to a partner for, I turn to Amina for, said Anne. Among the largely unacknowledged truths of female life is that women's primary, foundational, formative relationships are as likely to be with each other as they are with the men we've been told since childhood are supposed to be the people who complete us. Female friendship has been the bedrock of women's lives for as long as there have been women. In earlier eras, when there was less chance that a marriage entered early, often for practical, economic, and social reasons, would provide emotional or intellectual succor, I never say that word out loud. It's very, did I, I don't know if I said it right or not. <laughs> the, the perils of reading. <laughs> um, <clears throat> female friends offered intimate ballast. Now, when marriages may ideally offer far more in the way of a soulful, conf soulful satisfaction, but increasingly tend to begin later in life, if at all, women find themselves growing into themselves, shaping their identities, dreams, and goals, not necessarily in tandem with a man or within a traditional family structure, but instead alongside other women, their friends. Aminatu So was born in Guinea, the daughter of a Muslim diplomat father. Her mother was one of the first women to get an engineering degree in Guinea. Amina grew up in Nigeria, Belgium, and France, and attended the University of Texas at Austin. Anne Friedman was raised in eastern Iowa. Her parents are Catholic, and she went to the University of Missouri. I grew up in this very international world, said Amina. Anne is a Midwestern girl. In lots of ways, we're so far apart. There are a lot of things about us that complement each other and a lot of things we don't see eye to eye on. 
Among the things they had in common was their interest in and commitment to personal independence. For Amina, whose parents were the first in their families to marry for love and not as part of an arranged union, and whose grandfather had three wives and 21 children, living alone, unmarried, into her late 20s is an almost political statement. Singlehood, she said, simply, quote, isn't part of the world where I come from. It is a thing that never, ever happens. She is the first woman in her family to live alone, the first to make as much money as she does. Anne, who broke up with a boyfriend she'd brought to the Gossip Girl party several months after she and Amina became friends, has found enormous satisfaction in her adult singleness. In large part, she said, that's because in the years she spent officially uncoupled, she's found that friendships have become paramount. There is not a romantic relationship or a sexual relationship with a man that has even come close in two years, she said. Both women believe in what they call chosen families. I don't mean on just a feminist or academic level, Anne clarified. I mean that I believe if you choose to invest in people, the people you invest heavily in, heavily invest in you, and that is emotionally sustaining. It's an idea that's gaining some ground in scientific circles. As Natalie Angier reports, after years of anthropologists dismissing non-blood familial ties as fictive kin, researchers have, quote, recently pushed back against that distinction, arguing that self-constructed families are no less real or meaningful than conventional ones and are beginning to refer to them as a voluntary kin. Anne described her friends, Amina chief among them, as, quote, my emotional support, my everything. And Amina said, I always tell Anne she's the single most important relationship in my life. Not to put pressure on her, but because it's true. It feels like I've known her forever. A couple of years after Anne and Amina began to twine their lives around each other, Anne decided to leave Washington to pursue a work opportunity. The separation was devastating. Amina remembered in detail the things they did together to gear up for her best friend's departure. The packing and the deaccessioning of Anne's stuff and the goodbye partying. On the morning that Anne set off across the country, moving first to Austin, Texas, and then on to Los Angeles, Amina recalled how hard she cried. I went and got coffee at seven in the morning, and I was hysterical, she said. It was, it was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. I knew exactly how she felt. And then I tell a story about my own experience with a friend moving away. So those are the passages that I'm going to read. And I really hope that lots of people ha here have questions about anything and everything mm -hmm. regarding unmarried women. <laughs> Mics are open. Do you want to make your way? Otherwise, I'll have to start it. Okay. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, this doesn't relate specifically to the passages. That Please, no, don't. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've been thinking a lot lately about how young black people today have access to the civil rights movement, they can look to it with pride. And th not just them, but the entire society holds it up as an example of how we became better. Um, sorry. Um, young women don't have that experience with the women's rights movement. Feminism and that history is denigrated. It's treated as a joke. Mm -hmm. Most people, not most people, but a lot of young women today don't identify as feminists. And I've been thinking about it in the context of the election. And I just was kind of curious if that came up in the book and if you had any thoughts about that. Well, I, I have a lot of thoughts about it. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure if the starting point of the comparison between how we view the civil rights movement versus how we view feminism or the, the waves of feminism, I don't know if that comparison um, is a is the most useful place to start. I think I can, um, because it's so complicated, the ways that race and gender, gender intersect and the ways that uh, cultural and social messaging around um, social progress get made. And so I'm not sure that there's an equivalency there that's useful, but I certainly can speak to the, to the question about, um, <laughs> about why we're always made to feel bad about feminist achievement, which is the history of feminism. OK, and that's actually I was just having a conversation about this before before the reading since the um, all kinds of social movements um, for more equality for people who start with less equality disrupt um, the power structure when they're successful. And so they all incur various kinds of backlash when it comes to the women's movement, um, which has always been cacophonous, always been built on disagreement because and, and as it should. And this is one of a, an argument I make all the time. The women's movement, when it's healthy, um, is built on lots of people arguing with each other because it's supposed to represent the interests of 51 percent of the population. And that massive number of people 
are coming from such a variety of experiences, perspectives. They have differing priorities. They have differing needs. And if it's working right, they should all be talking loudly at each other. And so I, what is often diagnosed as, you know, the women's movement is in disarray. Feminism is broken. It's riven by discord. No, no, no. That means it's working. So, um, but that makes it vulnerable to a couple of things, including the eagerness to for everybody who is disrupted by its successes to say, it's broken, it's over, it's not going to work anymore. That has been true um, as long as there has been a women's movement. Um, I mean, I think that the the first use of the term anti, uh, um, anti-feminist um, or it came like in 19... 19- 20, like the day after the 19th Amendment was ratified. I mean, <laughs> this is, and, the, and with it, a diagnosis that feminism was now over, right? And we see it certainly in the way that we talk about generational discord, which is also a sign of health. <laughs> um, when you have the energies of young people coming in and not always working in, you know, young, young people's energies toward social progress must by definition be slightly different than older and more experienced people people's perspectives on social progress. And so you know that you're actually still moving in a forward direction when they're coming in and having their different energies are, are working to some degree against each other. And yet, we've read this a lot in the past few months, right? The fact that um, young women, um, and actually the polling now suggests it's young women in predominantly white states so far who have not been voting for Hillary Clinton are rejecting Hillary Clinton, which is not always the case, are rejecting feminism and are rejecting uh, their their mothers and grandmothers' investments in having a woman president. Right? There's a great eagerness to um, to pronounce feminism dead, and there's never been a period where that's not true. And uh, the only solace you can take in it is that it it usually means that feminism has just done something disruptive um, <laughs> and is continuing to threaten uh, the power structure. And the power structure's uh, inequities are why feminism exists in the first place. Um, but nobody's ever... It is absolutely true that we rarely... Um, there's not an easy, easily heroic snapshot of feminist history. Um, and I, I just think it's for a combination of these reasons that it's always been, you know, and that like any social movement, it has also, also always been an imperfect one that has been, you know, uh, but that doesn't set it apart actually from, you know, from environmental activism, from progressivism as a, as a whole, from the civil rights movement. Um, but feminism is the movement that, that very often, um, gets tagged, um, for a lot of its inequities as it should, um, so there's no there's no satisfying answer except to tell you that thus it has thus it has been thus it shall always be and you just gotta you know we just gotta keep doing feminism so <laughs> yeah Hi. Uh, Hi. Rebecca thanks so much for your book um, and all of your hard research uh, for uh, for doing this um, my question is here in D C we have one of the least married cities in mm-hmm. the country yeah. and such a concentration of well educated <coughs> independent single women. And um, I am curious to know if you think that there's like a demographic inevitability of, you know, things like this happening that Susan B. Anthony was alluding to late 19th century or things like that. We are sitting on something like a bit of a Silicon Valley of public service or change making among the women who live in D.C. Or and the follow up question to that, too, based on your recent interview on NPR um, was, uh, you know, these new relationships that we have in a post-marriage type environment, um, what does it mean for changes in public policy? You know, um, we're in D.C. here, and a lot of people work uh, in government and around the public sector, so a lot of these systems were designed for a family structure that doesn't exist anymore, or maybe won't in the future, so how do we redesign those systems? Thank you. All right. (laughs) Those are two very big questions with two slightly different answers. Um, (laughs) So the question about cities and, um, and the demographics of cities, I actually... There's a whole chapter in this book about the relationship between unmarried women and cities because it's it extends throughout history. Um, in fact, you know, when I was looking through the scholarship on unmarried women, you know, there's a great book about unmarried women in in early modern Europe, and you know, in in which I learned that when there when a lace factory opened in a small town, women would go from the farms to go work at the lace factory. They've always moved toward where there are jobs. Um, whether or not it was to evade marriage or simply to delay it or simply to be able to earn wages or to experience some brief window of, of freedom um, from their father's houses or and then their husband's houses, their, cities have always drawn women. And so you find that the 
median age of first marriage for women nationally now is 27, and it's higher than 30 in most cities, um, including Washington, D.C., including Boston, including New York. Um, in part, it is about the, the second half of your question uh, sort of touched on this. People are drawn to cities in some cases um, for things that don't have to do with finding a marital mate. So cities that have large numbers of colleges and universities, um, cities like this one that have a particular industry that <laughs> industry that that draws uh, a population of uh, professionally ambitious people who want to commit themselves to work in a particular field. Um, uh, you know, and as I said, I have a whole chapter about this in the book and the draw of urban life. Uh, er, cities also offer for women a kind of infrastructure that makes independent life more possible. Um, you know, the way that we, the, the way that we had organized ourselves along that nuclear family hetero early married model for so long, um, that was a model in which um, women were doing a lot of the domestic work to make men's earning and public and professional work possible. And there wasn't an equivalent support system for women, but cities go some way toward providing that kind of infrastructure and that kind of support system. The spaces in which you live in cities are smaller. There's less cleaning. Um, there's a public transportation system. There are jobs. There are networks of support. There are people who live. You're, you're, there's a higher density of neighbors and the possibility of sort of communal life. There's a, um, a single woman a uh, single mother in my book who talks about um, living in what she ultimately decided was uh, was quite a dangerous neighborhood in New York, um, also talked about the safety of having people out on the streets and her neighbors on the street. And as a single mother, being able to say, can you watch the kid for one second while I run across the street to the laundromat? Cities have laundromats. There are, there are what what in nuclear homes were unpaid domestic services become transactional paid services in cities so that instead of if you don't have a wife cooking you breakfast and doing your laundry you can go to a laundromat and a cart that's going to make you an egg sandwich and a cup of coffee and that and that permits women to live different kinds of economic and professional and public lives um, <clears throat> but then all kinds of other things happen when you have a lot of women flock to cities you get gender ratios that are imbalanced. There are a lot more single women in Washington, D.C. than there are single men. There are a lot more single women in New York City than there are single men. That's reversed in some of the West Coast cities, which is interesting because it sort of actually echoes old patterns of migration. And it's interesting that so many of the male-dominated fields in Silicon Valley lead to higher concentrations of single men. Um, in the West, still, it's very weird how those things persist. But um, uh, so, so then you get gender imbalances that then, you know, that then do work if you're talking about hetero partnership, which we're not exclusively, but in this case, if we're talking about men and women in a city that do make it more challenging to find a to find a mate. You get distractions, other things, a lot of a lot of not marrying, um, even for people who would like to marry and would certainly like to fall in love um, and find partnership and be known by another person and have somebody in, in bed at night. A lot of not marrying can also be a fullness of life and filling life with other things, with friends, with work, um, with the relationship to the city itself. Um, there's a woman in my book who talks about how she views a city, the city as her partner. Um, so yes, yes, a lot of that is in the book. I hope you will read it. I hope it's, <laughs> um, the, the question about public policy is really at the heart of the political questions laid out in this book, because I do posit here, um, that, we're looking at a remade nation. We are organized. Our civic structures, our economic policy, our social policy is indeed built around one kind of organization of the populace. And that organization is imagined to have one kind of American, in fact, the Ur American, the American citizen around whom we, you know, built enfranchisement and, um, you know, the, our idea of, of who is an American is remains and has long been a, a, a white man. And, um, in which there's one kind of American who does the earning and works in the professional and public sphere, and there's another kind of American who makes that public work and the earn and the economic um, reward possible by doing the domestic labor. We are not organized that way anymore. We're not organized that way in part because we have so many women and men living outside of those 
hetero married units because we have families that are being formed in a vast um, array of configurations, single parented, parented by by two parents of the same sex, um, because you have many hetero unions in which both people are earning and both people are doing domestic work and our social policies don't match this. And these are some of the big questions that are going to be determined really, you know, beginning with it, you know, they're already being activism is already pushing toward policies that are making this more possible. So in states, including California, Rhode Island, um, New Jersey that have paid mandated paid parental leave policies. Um, we also are seeing more paid sick day policies um, in cities around the country. Um, we're seeing better uh, pre-K programs, universal pre-K programs, which are also fundamental to addressing and supporting this newly reconfigured population. We see that activism happening. It also is going to have a lot to do with how people vote and how many people vote in 2016. Because if we wind up with a Republican president, a Republican, um, you know, Republicans are actually not in favor of many of the policies that would support this reconfigured <laughs> population. And so if we, and, and in fact, if they had executive... Um, legislative and judicial power, which they very well could um, over the next four to eight years, I think that a lot of the policies that they would shape and a lot of the progress that they would roll back um, would do the opposite of supporting this new configuration. It would it would actually um, create enormous barriers for women living independently of marriage and women living equally within marriage. Um, so the question of will public policy get reshaped. That's actually the fight we're in the midst of right now. Even if we're not, if we don't think of ourselves as actively politicized around it, and this population of unmarried women aren't unmarried in almost all cases because they're not unmarried because they're trying to make a political statement. This is not a self-consciously politicized movement. It is actually something far more threatening than that. It is the most radical um, of the ideas of sort of second wave feminism, the disestablishment of marriage as the central organizing force of women's adult life adopted as a mass behavior so that, so that women are not delaying marriage or abstaining from marriage because they want to make a statement. This is just, we've remapped what women's adulthood looks like. And that actually is a far more destabilizing thing than if it were just self-consciously political. So, but the question of what happens. Hi. Um, so I was oh, raised. Yeah, hi. hi. Uh, I was raised in very rural, very conservative Alabama by a single mom, mm. and uh, at the time it felt very anomalous, but it had a huge impact on my feminism and my ambition. I I went on to go to a women's college mm. in liberal Massachusetts, and and it just really shaped the person that I am. And so I'm curious, uh, now some of the women that I look up to most are badass ladies who are raising daughters who chose parenthood without ever thinking of marriage and partnership. And so I'm curious, as the number of unmarried women who are raising daughters increases, uh, what effect do you think that will have on the next generation of young women and girls? It's a fascinating question. And, it's, and, and you're absolutely right that those numbers are increasing exponentially. Um, you know, more than 50% of first births to women under 30 are outside of marriage. Um, it is becoming, there's been a crossover that actually took place in the 90s where the median, where the average age of first marriage rose above the average age of first motherhood. Um, and I mean, that I don't know if I can give a any kind of full answer to the kind of impact it's going to have on the next generation, um, in part because the circumstances of those women are so vastly different, especially depending on um, their income bracket. And one of the things uh, that I write about a lot in the book is poverty and how, and in part this ties to the ways in which our social and economic policies are not supporting new marriage patterns. Um, but 42% of single mothers live below the poverty line. And um, and half of minimum, when we talk about raising the minimum wage, half of minimum wage workers are single women and many of them mothers. Um, so, and that's going to be an extremely different set of resources that their daughters and sons start out with than the resources offered to the also expanding population of more affluent women who are deciding to have children on their own um, and who have an, many more doors open to them. So I don't think that there's one universal um, 
answer or even really a guess yet. The one thing I will say is that all these changes and in increases in single motherhood, actually, it's interesting, something that Gloria Steinem says in this book about single motherhood that is a, the, because part of my argument is, you know, you're you're having you're getting generations that whose eyes are being adjusted to these new family formations and are no longer assuming the hetero early married to hetero partner parented households as a norm and thus are adjust, uh, adjusting their expectations to all different sorts of paths that women and men might be taking. Um, a point that Gloria Steinem sort of makes is the normalization of single motherhood reinscribes the roles of maternity and domesticity on women and, um, and takes men out of it. I don't, you know, her argument is not against single motherhood. It is you have to make sure that there are men participating in the domestic work and child rearing in other ways, even if they're not the parent or partner. Anyway, so I think very everybody's guessing about the kind of impact it would have. But I think that one of the things that we must do is acknowledge the vastly different scope of opportunity that is offered to to a population that is having families and, and just has so many different resources and lack of resources. Hi. Hi. Is it Maybe unfortunately a slightly nerdy question, but no, I that's do I don't know. I hope I can give a nerdy answer. Yeah, that's right. terrifying. Yeah, it's a, it's a cause and effect question. <laughs> okay. sort of question, um, as you pointed out, um, you know, and starting in the say the late 19th century, uh, some independent unmarried women had a very outsized effect on social progress that's gone on since then. They weren't the only forces, but they were certainly. At, on a per person basis, they were, had a very outsized effect. Um, so the question is, is that because that being an independent unmarried woman in that time was a gutsy thing to do, and gutsy people tend to have an outsized effect on everything? Or is it because being independent was liberating and allowed them, you know, gave them the time and so forth to have an outsized effect on Thing. So I don't know if you see this difference that I'm oh, getting Oh, no, at, I do. It I, seems I, to me to be hugely important because if, if it's the latter, that is that the liberation itself gives women time to do great things, then the much greater numbers that we have, uh, have of independent women now, proportionally in the population and so forth, should lead to just gigantic social progress. <laughs> Whereas on the other hand, if it's if it's the former, if it's the former, then the uh, the fact that they were in the, 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 the there was a selection process at work, mm -hmm. and the, and the ones that had the outsized effect were simply the gutsy ones, and they would have had their big effect even if they were married or even if they hadn't been relieved of. Uh, so the question is, which of those two kind of extreme cause of causative uh, factors do you think is the more important one and how how does that what does that have to say about going forward you know about the future so. well it's interesting I think I pose a related question but I pose it I don't answer it in the book <laughs> about <laughs> because I can't I can't answer it for sure um, a lot of this is guesswork not just about history but about what's happening now and what motivates change and what motivates behavior um, but there was a lot of talk when women first started entering secondary education and, and going into graduate schools and this was really around the turn of the turn of the century into the 20th century um, early 20th century and there was a lot of talk in the press about how the marriage rates were just abysmal for women who graduated from college and there was this cause and effect question were the women who were going to college women who wanted to avoid marriage and thus were pursuing other paths? Or did the fact of their education make them unappealing to mates? And men didn't want to marry women who were above their, who were getting above their station. And I, I mean, and, and this is, I, I sort of lay this, we don't know, right? There's no, it's probably a combination of a lot of these things, sure. right? One of the things that was true in the 19th century though, is that because it wasn't simply, um, because it wasn't, I, I guess my best guess would be that there are a lot of gutsy women for whom marriage really did box up their ambitions. Um, and even if it was a matter of, oh, the women who wound up single... Um, and again, it was circumstance. Some of them were were well done, you know, well rid of marriage. They were like, whew, you know, it's terrific that I don't have to do this thing that, you know, killed my mother. Um, but 
<laughs> Seriously, that's <laughs> it, it. Did often, <laughs> um, but but um, you know, in another era, you know, what if there had been circumstances where somebody like Susan B. Anthony had been married. Now, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was married and she had seven children. So it's not that there weren't married activists right. who also did this, but but what if some of the women, um, you know, had been married and had had multiple children? It's sort of impossible, gutsy, whether it was guts that got them out there, if they had had the burdens of repeated pregnancies, um, of having to be the ones to tend to children and home, would they have been able to power the mo movements that they did? And I think, right. I think it's very unlikely. Um, as I said, now what you're looking at is a really mass behavior. So there are any number of millions of women who are single right now because they're gutsy, and there are any number of millions of women who are single and gutsy, but also really wish that they were married for any number of reasons um, right. or were in relationships. But... Um, in this case, and to some degree in the 19th century, where the men really were not there for the marrying in many cases, right. um, you know, you got the whole variety of women exposed because the, the early marriage model was removed to some extent. Right. So. Well, man, my assumption was that women, independent women now don't need to be quite as gutsy as, they, as an independent independent woman needed to be in 1870. It's certainly so easier, know. but I still think it it's requires easy, a lot of easier, guts. Right. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. Easier yeah. or not easy. So. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Hi. Thanks for being here tonight. I'm Thank a big, uh, I'm fangirling out. I'm a total nerd. <laughs> um, I don't have a specific question, but um, as someone who's read a lot of your work and listens to Call Your Girlfriend and heard that episode where you were on, I really want to hear you talk tonight about um, the power of single women and the 2016 election, mm -hmm. especially given what happened recently um, with uh, Gloria Steinem and Ma uh, Madeleine Albright um, and the sort of, it seems as though the people who are offended by those statements were single women, um, but then also looking beyond the primary and your, uh, just sort of your take on them, this group as a powerful voting, voting block for the primary as well. Um, well, so in, in 2012, unmarried women, uh, unmarried women have tremendous electoral power. Um, in 2012, they were 23% of the electorate, which is like, I mean, a quarter of the electorate and they voted 67 to 31 for Barack Obama over Mitt Romney. Um, that is, it's a sort of staggering gap and there are now so many unmarried women that if they come out to vote, they could, I mean, they really could decide an election. They could be the factor that pushes somebody over the top. They would push the Democrat over the top because they vote overwhelmingly for Democratic politicians and Democratic policies. For And I touched on this before because they, those are the policies that so much better support not just independent women, but this whole new configuration of the citizenry. Um, of course, the problem is that Single women are also amongst the bloc's hardest hit by voting restrictions and the ways in which many states have cons have successfully already conspired to make voting so much harder. Um, because unmarried women, um, for precisely the reasons that it's so important for them to vote and shift policy, often find it so much harder. Women who have kids who don't have affordable or accessible childcare, who are working multiple jobs, who cannot you know, find the place where you go to register that's open every third Tuesday when the moon is full, that is now what you have to do in order to get your special identification that permits you to vote in a county. And, you know, um, that is hardest for women who have all kinds of structural impediments to finding that kind of time and going to do it. Women who aren't going to be able to take hours to, to wait outside a polling place. So um, in franchise, and that's, by the way, that's the idea of the voting restrictions, right? That's That means, you know, to the extent that they depress turnout of unmarried women who also disproportionately tend to be young and tend to be women of color, um, that's the idea of voting restrictions. <laughs> um, and uh, so the question is how many of them will vote? If they do vote, um, they will almost certainly vote for whoever the Democratic nominee is. Um, yeah, I think that the Albright and 
Steinem comments were pretty fascinating. A very similar thing happened in 2008. In fact, the, that particular weekend <laughs> where it was Gloria Steinem, Madeleine Albright, and Bill Clinton, I think, who was also saying some unhelpful things about <laughs> young women, unsurprisingly, <laughs> uh, <laughs> in the dictionary under unhelpful. <laughs> so uh, I, it, that felt like a reunion tour of the 2008 campaign. And... Uh, um, yeah, I mean, the, I think the Steinem and Albright comments were very different. Um, and there's, I don't, I have no desire to defend either of them, actually. Um, I will say that the Albright one, I mean, the, the Albright comment is one that I just profoundly disagree with. Like, I just don't think it's true in any circumstance, regardless of, I mean, I don't, I, I think there might be a special place in hell for women who go out of their way to be extra critical of other women, but that's a very different sentiment from there's a place in hell for women who don't support other women. Um, it, but, you know, it's like on a Starbucks cup. It's a thing she says and uh, when talking about women. And um, it was sort of the worst thing you could possibly say in the context of, of this campaign and at this juncture. Um, the Steinem comment, I, I have to say, was so sad to me because uh, Steinem, who I interviewed in my first book, and actually whose story of single life, and she talked to me for this book too, is one of the hearts of this book. And her story of her role as an activist and then and her eventual marriage in her 60s um, runs through this book and is, again, incredibly moving. She was also a, a thread in my first book about the 2008 election that was incredibly moving. Um, one of the unfortunate things about Steinem saying that is that one of the things she's been great on, in 2008 she got in trouble writing an op-ed that I think, going back to an earlier question, sort of problematically contrasted the way we feel about race and the way we feel about gender as if those things are not completely intertwined. Um, but she was always great on the generational difference. Gloria Steinem has been wonderful with young women. Gloria Steinem has always had the best answers about young women. She is always, in fact, in the Bill Maher thing, the, you know, she's going on for five minutes before she says that stupid thing about how much she respects young women and how they're so much more radical and activists than, than her generation was. She always has this great line where she says, I didn't go around thanking anybody for the vote. You know, why should young women go around thanking me for whatever I did? So this is, it, it made me sad because it was, and she apologized. And I think that actually was the, um, you know, was was the lesser, you know, it was not problematic. It was just sad because it's so in opposition to everything she's been great on amongst second waivers who feel a very, many of whom, some of whom have felt and expressed a totally understandable, natural, again, I think generational tension shows that it's working, um, you know, anxiety about the differences between their perspectives and young people's perspectives. Gloria has always stood out as being just terrific about bridging that divide, and this was a really unfortunate moment. The one thing I would say, though, about young women in the campaign is that I have been so impressed by Hillary's messaging on this, and I am not always impressed by the ease and grace of her messaging, but on this one front, she has been giving the best answer on this because it is the true answer, and she's been pulling it off like, I mean, every time she does it, I'm like, yes, 10. <laughs> um, because in, if you're Hillary Clinton, every debate you've ever been in and every interview has, for the ho your whole career, has involved some variation on the following question, which is, so, Madam, First Lady, Senator, Secretary, people hate you. <laughs> Respond. <laughs> and, and this year's variation... <laughs> This year's variation has been, young women hate you. Respond. And you know, how would any, like this is, I'm telling you, so this is like, and, and she's got the best response right now, which is she says, I'm so thrilling. She, she says, I'm so thrilled to see them so engaged with Bernie Sanders' campaign. And I'm so excited to see that, how passionate they feel about Bernie. And um, I hope that I can earn their support down the road and they may not be for me but I'm for them and I'm like yes great perfect <laughs> done <laughs> um and so that was also what made it particularly sad to me that those generation that the sort of generational resentments got aired at that point
I, was there? Hi, Trister. Hi, Michaela. <laughs> um, so I was talking to one of my older sisters the other day about Roxanne Gay's book, Bad Feminist, mm-hmm. and she was telling me that um, <laughs> since she has become a mom, she's a mom of two young kids, she has started to apply that label to herself of a bad feminist mm-hmm. um, because she feels this like intensely powerful and unexpected um, like love force to be with her kids all the time, um, which makes her really happy. But makes her feel like she is a bad feminist. And I was wondering if you might be able to, as someone who seems to have, from the outside, you know, walked that very treacherous line well um, and transferred, you know, gone from being a single lady to a, you know, badass journalist and a mom um, and a married person, how, how you have done that in your own life or maybe how you've seen your friends walk that line. Well, um, I think that, I don't know. I would never want to hold my my life up as any kind of model or example. I will say that feminism has never included the suggestion that you shouldn't love your kids a lot. <laughs> um, in fact, um, you know, sort of the ability to combine. I mean, my, the feminism as I understand it and as it motivates me, um, and I'm not. I actually kind of loathe the like choice, the the limpid language of you know just choice feminism and choose your choice and whatever it is. But I do think that, but I but but what is true is that what I want women to be able to do um, and have equal opportunity to do is to pursue a variety of passions with the same intensity that men are permitted to pursue a variety of passions. And by the way, that includes, I think men should, I would like to see more space for men to pursue passions that they've been cut out from, including domestic ones and, and parental ones. Um, And so for me, my vision of what feminism is never limited my ability, you know, or my, anxieties about loving my kids too much or loving a husband too much, you know, one of the, and, and so, and I, and I think that sometimes when we adopt that, we're actually adopting what is an anti-feminist frame. We are, there have always been kind of anti-feminist myths about feminism. One of the things that's good about Roxanne's book, one of the many things that's great about Roxanne's book is she's sort of exploding a lot of those things and saying this is feminism, you know, Um, because it's been an anti-feminist talking point for a long time that feminist women in addition to being ugly, not shaving their legs, and hating men, also <laughs> loathe children. Um, <laughs> um, and and I've been hearing that a lot, actually, the past couple days from the uh, men's rights activists who've been um, writing blog posts about this book, which they have not yet <laughs> read, but they have definitely decided <laughs> that it's... <laughs> That its major failing is that it does. It's probably not honest about the fact that the reason that women aren't getting married is because men now hate them because they're ugly feminists who want to work and um, you know reject children. So so and I think a lot of but I do think a lot of feminists um, it, because those anti-feminist messages are so strong and the sort of a vision of feminism that is about limitation and punishment and censure rather than about the expansion of opportunity and and moving toward to forward toward more kinds of equality um, of opportunity because the anti-feminist message is so strong I think many of us have even unconsciously adopted it so um, you know I would tell her to not worry about loving her kids it's pretty fun to love your kids you know and um, and I don't know that I, I you know it, Feminism is massive and cacophonous and and it contains multitudes. Um, and there are no, there are no, um, you don't get, what's that word? It's sororities when you get, um, no, at, when you get cut out, when you're thrown out. What is it? It's you're deactivated. You don't get deactivated <laughs> um, from feminism and you don't have to turn in your membership card and you don't have to, you know, and there's no, you know, there's no entrance fee either and you don't have a membership card. Mem- you know, feminism, feminism is whatever the women who are feminists make it. Um, I just, are, are you in line for a question? No, you're not. No, yeah, you're not. Okay. I think we are, we're winding down. We have time. Yes, you are. No. Okay. Come up. So, and you, how many people are in line here? Three, two. I think we have time for those of you who are in line. If you promise to make your questions reasonably short, I will promise to we're make kind my of uh, short a little too. bit past our hour, but we want to get to everybody, so um, we'll wrap it up with you three. Okay? My answers will now be one word. Hi, Tristan. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. A- 
Um, so the rise of, you know, single ladies and late married women necessarily, not to be too heteronorm- heteronormative about it, entails the later coming of age of men if you see marriage as their coming of age. So could you speak a little bit about how this is impacting young men in their like 20s and 30s other than learning how to do their laundry right well the learning how to do their laundry is actually crucial so um it seriously is crucial so um this is i do write about men in this book and write about exactly that in part um because yes heteronormatively, um, when women marry less and marry later, men also marry less and later. And so that population has expanded too. They're not the focus of my book. And, um, and that's not to say that they shouldn't be. And I hope that there are people writing many books about how this changes the world for men. Um, but the thing that I'm interested in with regard to women is how revolutionary it is. The fact is, historically, there has always been room for men to live independently in the world. There have been supports. There, there have been, they have been able to economically support themselves. They've been able to have more liberated versions of sex lives outside of or in advance of marriage, in part because reproduction doesn't take place in their bodies, in part because they're not, for that reason, not subject to the same kind of insidious double standards that women are. And, um, and so the existence of single men throughout history, while in many cases has raised eyebrows and been emotionally difficult for them and had all kinds of, you know, there are all kinds of challenges, but it hasn't, the fact that there are more single men isn't the kind of rupture of expectation um, and of power distribution that this eruption of a massive generation of single women is. And so that's, and so women are at the center of my book. But the fact, but, you know, Spoiler alert, one of the massive, one, one of the revolutions involves men knowing how to do their laundry, um, which is, that's one of the things I care most about in this book, is the argument about why that is absolutely crucial toward moving us toward more equitable relationships. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for being here. I think I speak for a like, millennial DC feminist group who <laughs> really consistently relies on your insights in writing. Thank so you. Thank you. Thank um, you. My question is about women's political representation. You've written about how historically the model was to towards representation was to go through marriage, to, through your man, for your husband's mm-hmm. career, and that that, of course, single womanhood in large numbers changes that. And, of course, that begs talking about Hillary. Um, but just about how that will change political women and political representation, the landscape, and will it move us more towards this, like women versus women versus women on all sides that we dream of someday, um, um, conservative, left, et cetera. So. I'm so glad you, you too dream of the women versus yes. women versus women. This is one of the problems with the, with the Madeleine Albright statement is that my dream is like political fights and <laughs> elections where it's just, you know, women versus women. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, we're seeing... One of the things is it's so it's so sad to talk about because the representation of women in our politics and in our government is so sparse still. The idea that it's still only 20 percent of Congress that we have never in our history. I mean, you know, we haven't ever had a woman major party nominee for the presidency. We have never had a woman vice president like this is just it's batshit. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's a perversion of what we are supposed to be as a nation. Um, That said, given um, the relatively disproportionately small um, percentage of women who are represented in government, the the pipeline is filling with women who who are living the lives that I'm writing about in this book. Um, I mean, you can Donna Edwards, who's running for Barbara Mikulski's Senate seat um, in Maryland, is a single mother. Um, Kamala Harris, who is running for Barbara Boxer's. Senate seat in California, um, was single until her forties. I can't remember if she was married at 49 for the first time or at 40. Um, Lucy Flores, um, from Nevada, who's running for Congress is single. She has spoken, oh, she's in her late thirties. She's spoken openly about having had an abortion as a, as a teenager, uh, partly because she wanted to maintain her independence. Um, the great Georgia legislator, uh, Stacey Abrams, who's, I believe is someday going to be president, um, is a single woman. Um, and you see these women and even somebody like Kirsten Gillibrand, who we think of is 
uh, you know, she's a traditionally hetero married person with two kids. Well, she got married in her late 30s and she had a baby after sitting through some like 12 hour hearing when she was 42 years old and, and serving in Congress. That is also a representation of this kind of changed marriage pattern. So as more women who have lived lives outside of this old traditional model move into representational government, and it's no accident that these are women who are also, it's not an accident that Kirsten Gillibrand is pushing the Family Act. And so, which is, which would mandate paid parental leave. Um, and so as more women get into these, you can't do the easy equation of like more women means, but we don't have enough of a sample to even be able to tell if that's true. Everybody's always saying, well, show me where the numbers are that if you have a woman at the top, well, we can't do that because there have not been enough women at the top. So we can't present those numbers to you. Um, but, but it is true that, that our slowly our, our government is beginning to look a little bit more like what our country looks like slowly, very slowly. You know, we've only ever had one black woman senator, one in the history of the Senate, and only two women of color ever in our history. So we need, this is a massive project. Hi. Hi. I would like to close out this evening by talking about something that's really important to me, my vagina. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping that you, mm -hmm. um, leave me feeling really optimistic about um, this new wave of disruption and change and, and women living different, interesting, varied lives that will lead toward this bullshit of, <laughs> sorry, of um, um, white men trying to tell me what to do with my body that, that will end eventually, or at least, you know. You want me to provide you optimism that white men are gonna stop telling you yes. what to do with your body? <laughs> No. I am, I am, I am, everything is on you. <laughs> no. <laughs> or at least that my, my, my two daughters are not going to have to have the same damn fight that we're having right now. Say yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're totally having the same fight that we're having now. Hopefully it's going to be easy and they're going to be easier and there are going to be more of them and they're going to be, uh, I mean, there are men in this room, there are men having this fight too. Hopefully they're going to be more men. Um, but I, and I do, I am optimistic, right? In, the, in this book, this book, the whole idea of this book is an optimistic idea. In the face of a lot of reasons for pessimism, in the face of, I mean, this is a fundamentally optimistic book about unmarried women in America when the, the truth is that a lot of them are suffering economically. And I'm, and I, I'm not being dishonest about that here. That, that, those stories are, are here too. But it's nonetheless optimistic about the direction we're moving, but it's really slow. Um, my last book was optimistic. That book was called The Election That Changed Everything for American Women. That, that was a very optimistic title. <laughs> um, I am a real optimist about the direction that we're moving, but I cannot be optimistic about the notion that it is going to be quick or that it's going to be easy. On that optimistic note, we should be optimistic about this year, maybe. Um, and uh, I hope you'll all buy the book.